Um, let me shift gears and I want to talk now about dysmenorrhea. This is menstrual pain. Okay, why am I talking about that? Because insulin is the issue in diabetes. For reproductive issues, now we're talking estrogens. Can I control that? Let me show you. I was sitting at my desk and a young woman gave me a call and she said, Dr. Breiner, I need your help. I can't get out of bed. A lot of women have menstrual pain, but for maybe one in 10, it's like off the scale, I can't go to work today type pain. Oh, hold on for me, just one quick second. I'm just gonna technical issue here. Okay, they're ho hopefully we're all right. Um, she called me up and she said she had menstrual pain and many women have it, but for, for about one in 10, it's really almost disabling and it means you're just not functional that day. And she asked me if I could give her some painkillers. And I said, yeah, I, I sure can. Let's give you painkillers for a couple of days. But how are we going to stop this from happening again next month? And the month after that, what's, what's the cause of this? I asked her if she would like to do a diet experiment with me. And here's what the experiment was. We said, could you do for four weeks, no animal products and keep oils really, really low? She said, I'll try anything. And after a month, actually 28 days later, she called me up and said, Dr. Brown, this is amazing. I got my period today with no symptoms whatsoever. And the month after that, same story. The month after that, same story. Um, if she deviated a little bit from these guidelines, pain came back. So I thought that was encouraging. This worked. Um, but I thought, thought we need more evidence. Uh, we need to do a good study to really see what's going on. And so what we did with the Department of Obstetrics and, G and Gynecology at Georgetown University, we brought in women who had menstrual pain and half of them started the same diet. The other half got a supplement that was actually a placebo. And after two cycles, two, uh, two months, uh, they switched. The diet group started the supplement, the supplement group started the diet. And in a, in a nutshell, it worked. We published the findings in the Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And what we reported was that the pain intensity dropped, the pain duration dropped, PMS symptoms dropped like uh, wa uh, water retention and bloating and moodiness, all these things got better. Um, so why <laughs> does this work? How is it that getting the animal products off your plate and keeping oils really low, how can that affect your menstrual cycle? Okay, here's how it works. You see this graph? This graph is the amount of estrogen in a woman's blood. There are actually many estrogens. Estradiol is the main one, um, but uh, here I'm gonna call them all just estrogens. At the beginning of her cycle, she doesn't have much estrogen in her blood. You see that? But after about two weeks, she, it, she rises to a peak and then it falls. She's ovulating. And then for the next week, that, that third week, the uterus is the most optimistic organ in the body. Every month it thinks, this is the big one. We might get pregnant this month. I can just feel it. Um, and so the estrogen level rises to get the body ready for pregnancy. But after that week, the disappointed uterus discovers we're not pregnant. And the amount of estrogen falls. And so then the uterine lining is discarded as menstrual flow and everything starts over the next month. Okay, let me show you the real key here is that food affects all of this function. This is the uterus in the middle of the screen. Off to the sides, you see the ovaries and they're connected by the fallopian tubes. In the very center of your screen, you see that pink lining? That's the endometrium. That means the inside of the uterus. And as estrogen levels rise, that endometrial layer thickens up to get ready for pregnancy. Okay, so when Robin called me up, what was going through my mind is you've got pain. I will bet you that you've got too much estrogen coursing through your blood. And it's making that endometrial layer thicken up a little too much. And when that happens, it causes prostaglandins to be produced and they cause pain. Okay, so if this is driven by estrogens, and if food changes can control estrogens, can I make 
menstrual cramps go away to pace, depending on what I eat? Yes, but hold, hold, hold that thought. There's something even worse. I showed you the, the, the thickened lining of the uterus. There's a condition called endometriosis. It's the same cells, but they're not lining the uterus now. They've escaped. They're planting, implanting all around the abdomen. You see those little kind of raisin looking blobs? That's endometrial tissue that's now outside the uterus and it's implanting on the uterus, on the ovaries, on the fallopian tubes, on your intestinal tract. And so what that means is these bits of cells swell up, they bleed, they scar, they cause all kinds of problems month after month after month after month. They'll make your intestinal tract misfire. Everything goes wrong. And the doctor says, well, um, let me give you painkillers. If that's not working, I'll put you on the pill. If that doesn't work, come to the operating room, we'll cut all the, that tissue out. And you do, and two years later, you're back again with the same problems. Wait, when Robin called me up and she asked for help, what I realized is that at Tufts University, back in the 90s, researchers had done some uh, studies on how you can control hormones with food. They brought in 48 premenopausal women. They tested short-term diets, lower fat diets or higher fiber diets. And what they were trying to see was not could you control menstrual pain. They were focusing on breast cancer. Because if I can get breast cancer under control by just some diet changes, that's huge. Okay, but while she was talking to me on the phone, while this young woman was talking to me on the phone, I thought, okay, we already know from our studies to try to control estrogen for breast cancer that I can reduce estrogen by doing what? Reducing fat. Yep, that's right. If you do nothing other than just reduce fat, estrogen falls. If you do nothing other than increase fiber, estrogen falls. So when the young woman asked me for help and I said, vegan diet, the reason I suggested that is I wanted to eliminate all the animal fat. And I said, keep oils really low. I thought, if we do that, we're going to maximize our control over estrogen. And since it's a vegan diet, everything you're eating is either a fruit or a vegetable or a bean or a grain or some kind of combination of that. And that means everything on your plate is giving you fiber. So it's the best of all worlds. Low fat, high fiber should help. And bingo, that was exactly it. Now I have to confess, this was just an educated guess on my part. It worked for her, but that's not good enough. We've got to then test it in a larger group of women, which is what we did. Then we've got to submit it for peer review and for publication. And then people can use this for their own benefit. And that's exactly what happened. And you can use it too. Okay. Um, by the way, you might ask, how can cutting fat reduce estrogen? And the short answer is we don't really know. The physiology of that has never been worked out. All we know is when women come in and you cut the fat in their diet and you do it a lot. I mean, um, keeping cooking oils low, animal products gone, and even things like guacamole and peanut butter and nuts, you keep them really low. When you do that, their estrogen levels fall and their symptoms improve much better than if the fats are in there. But we don't know exactly why it is that reducing fat lowers estrogen. With fiber, we do know. Here's why. Uh, you see that the, the liver, the liver is the, on the top part of the slide here. Your liver, filters estrogens out of your blood to a degree, and it sends those estrogens down the, that green biliary tree, the bile duct, into your intestinal tract. And then your, as the estrogens go down your small intestine, down your large intestine, they are actually flushed right down the toilet. Here's the problem. If you don't have fiber in your diet, they don't stay in your intestinal tract. If you don't have fiber in your diet, those estrogens reabsorb back into the bloodstream. And they cycle around in what's called enterohepatic circulation. They end up back at the liver, they come back into the intestine, they cycle around. So a woman's got unwanted estrogen cycling through her blood every minute, every day, until she starts a high fiber, low fat, plant-based diet that interrupts that cycling and allows the estrogens to get out of her body. What? Is it as easy as 
whole grain, oatmeal, beans, vegetables. Yes, those are the foods that give you the fiber that nature had in mind for you, but these are kind of old fashioned foods. So we're not gonna eat vegetables anymore. We're not gonna eat beans anymore. We're not gonna eat whole grains anymore. We're not gonna have fruit. We're gonna have like a cup of yogurt that I bought. Forget that stuff. That doesn't have the fiber in it that you need. Okay, I wanna make sure that people are paying attention. This is spam. Does spam have fiber in it? Does spam have fiber? No, because it's not a plant. Fiber is only in plants. So this is a trash can. And the spam can go right there. Okay, very good. Now, does KFC have fiber? Well, if you eat the carton, you'd get a little fiber, but otherwise, no, chicken is not a plant. Chicken doesn't have fiber, so that can go too. All right, um, now there are some things that started out life as plants, but somehow in the factory, all their fiber was removed, and I think we're going to get rid of that stuff too. Okay, let me share with you an experience. This is Catherine. Catherine grew up in Louisiana, and she was an aerospace engineer working for the Air Force. 2003, she got an all-expense-paid trip to Iraq. Catherine's job was to build military bases. And I got to tell you, when you work really hard in a war zone and you eat what the government gives you to eat, you do not gain a whole lot of weight. And so that was Catherine's experience. And finally, her tour of duty came to the end and she went back home to the U.S. And when she got off the plane, her, her family welcomed her back and said, Catherine, what foods did you miss while you were over in Iraq? And you know what she missed? mac and cheese, cheese snacks, all this, you know, cheesy foods. And in fact, a friend of hers for her birthday gave her an entire carton, entire case of mac and cheese dinners, 48 of them, which she ate for 48 days straight. Well, Catherine gained some weight, no big surprise. And she also got endometriosis, which as I mentioned, can lead to pain and lead to infertility because the endometriosis, those cells, those raisins that are outside your uterus attack the ovaries. They attack the fallopian tubes. They can strangle them off. This is her problem. Hormones didn't help. Painkillers didn't help. Eventually her doctor said, well, Rob, uh, uh, Catherine, you really ought to have a hysterectomy. Just have everything out and, and your pain will be gone. What, get my uterus removed? She was 27. And Catherine said, you know, my husband and I are sort of newlyweds. We haven't started our family yet. I don't know that I really want to have a hysterectomy right now. But the doctor said, well, the extent of your endometriosis is really severe. You are almost certainly infertile anyway. Let's just get rid of your pain. Get, every, get all these organs out and you'll be fine. And believing that she was infertile, she agreed to this doctor's suggestion and they scheduled the surgery. But before she could have the surgery, she heard about the diet changes that, that we've been just describing. And she began a diet that had no animal products in it and kept oils really low. And week by week, she started to feel better. She felt a lot better actually, but she didn't feel entirely better. She still had some residual pain. So she thought, all right, I need to get rid of that too. And if I'm infertile, I'll just go through it. I'll have the hysterectomy. She went to the operating room. They put her to sleep. An hour later, she woke up. She was in the recovery room. And the doctor said, Catherine, I need to talk to you. I opened you up, but I didn't take out your uterus. I didn't do the hysterectomy. Because when I looked inside, your endometriosis is almost entirely gone. And the reason that you had some residual pain is because you had scarring where it used to be and that created adhesions, but I was able to free up those adhesions and I think you're gonna be fine now. And her mother was in the, in the recovery room with her and her mother said, she went vegan. And of course the doctor said, stop it. Wait a minute, listen, endometriosis is not related to what you eat. And there is no way that a diet could cure endometriosis. This must be a miracle. Nothing to do with diet. Okay, well, wait a minute. First of all, good on that doctor for not taking her uterus out. 
But what he missed is that endometriosis is driven by estrogens and estrogens are driven by what you eat. And with food cho choices, you can bring your estrogen levels down and the endometriosis apparently can change. Okay, very, very important. So she lost a lot of weight. And there are her three children. That's right, she wasn't infertile. And she started, well, frankly, she made a career change. She wanted to let other women know what you can do to change your own life and to take, take your own health in your own hands so that you can do better. Don't get me wrong, medical care is a great thing, but we wanna have a healthy diet in addition to good quality medicine.